Classes in Polymer Dynamic, based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Lecture 16, Even More on Probe Diffusion. I'm Professor Phillies, and today I'm going to continue our discussion on optical probe diffusion in polymer solutions. We begin with section 9.10 of my text, which discusses specifically the very extensive series of studies of optical probe diffusion and hydroxypropyl cellulose. Now, there are several reasons why HPC is of interest. Uh, one is that if you take HPC from 10 or 25 degrees centigrade in water, which is a good solvent, and head up to something like 41 centigrade, you approach what is at least a pseudo theta point. There's distinct change in the solubility of the material and other, and other properties. This has been studied, for example, by Paul Russo, among others. The reason we got into it originally was quite different. Namely, we started off doing what were supposed to be straightforward studies. We will measure the diffusion of probes of different sizes. We will measure the viscosity of the solution. We will look for non-Stokes-Einsteinian behavior. And we found an anomaly. And the anomaly is as follows. Here's the viscosity. Here's the concentration. And here's a stretched exponential concentration dependence. As we saw in the viscosity chapter, that is the behavior you most commonly find, but not always. At the time, though, we thought this was, since we'd done a fair number of measurements and looked at some literature, this is what you always saw. But it's not what you always see. Instead, here goes the stretched exponential. And at about this point, there's a crossover. And the crossover, if I have cleverly plotted this as log eta versus log c, is to a, a power law in c. So down here, we have e to the alpha, c to the nu. We have a stretched exponential concentration dependence. Up here, we have a power law concentration dependence. There is a crossover. Uh, Carol Ann Quinlan, who was in my laboratory, did extremely extensive, careful measurements of the shape of that curve and particularly near the crossover point, lots and lots of points. And what we were able to do was to take the measurements, because there were lots and lots of points, fit groups, neighboring groups of, oh, five or seven points to a linear or a quadratic. Quadratic gives you slightly less noisy data. And you could get the slope. Well, you could get d log eta, d log c, all along. And what we found was the slope. That's, of course, the slope of this curve is continuous. There is perhaps a wiggle up here. And we, weren't, we didn't pursue the wiggle any more carefully. But the important issue is that the slope is at least very nearly continuous. The curves are very nearly continuous. There is no crossover region whatsoever in which neither set of measurements applies. There's just nothing there up to, gee, there's some experimental limit on accuracy. So we had this procedure. And we described this as a transition, a solution light. This is the solution-like region. Melt-like transition. Now, we could have given it some other name, but we carefully chose names that did not refer to any of the models that were out in the literature, because we were making no claim that it was a transition of a particular sort predicted by a particular theoretical model. 
We also measured the intrinsic viscosity, which is sort of essentially the linear slope, viscosity versus concentration, low concentration. And this transition occurs at C eta, that is concentration in natural units of about four. As we saw in the viscosity chapter, though, you can find this transition in a perfectly respectable number of systems. It's not a freak due to the particular chemical nature of hydroxypropyl cellulose. However, in different systems, the transition occurs at very different concentrations, including C8 of 35, C8 of 80. Hydroxypropyl cellulose is of some particular interest for the excellent reason that the transition occurs at very low concentrations when the systems aren't very viscous and therefore they're relatively easy to work with. Well, having said we saw this transition and we were able to display this curve demonstrating the continuity, well, there was some controversy as to whether it was a real phenomenon or not. And there were people who suggest, well, this is some artifact of curve fitting. Now, in point of fact, these are both fairly extended curves. A power law on a log-log plot always gives you a straight line. There's no straight line down here. A stretched exponential uh, on a power law on a log-log plot always gives you a smooth curve of non-zero curvature. This is a straight line at least within experimental accuracy. Uh, the highest, this viscosity is, if memory serves, something like 10 to the 2. Uh, we got up to, she got up to 3 times 10 to the 5th. There were people who were saying, well, are you seeing shear thinning, your instruments, etc., etc. At the top end of the curve, the flow times through the capillary viscometer, despite using the largest bore of viscometer we could find commercially. The flow times were, oh, four or five hours. So she would arrive early, get everything set up, and be able to come back for lunch and then watch the experiment finish. It was very successful. Nonetheless, there were a bunch of people who did object to this, and so we started doing probe diffusion in this system. Having explained why we got into this, I should point out we actually were not the first people to study HPC water. And that was a great help because there were a number of things that had been found that simplified our work. A one interesting bit, which was additional evidence that, gee, there's some funny phenomena here, is a study duty Yang and Jameson And what they did was to put probe particles into hydroxypropyl cellulose solution and measure diffusion coefficient versus polymer concentration. Uh, and one thing they observed, at least under some conditions, was that you had non-Stokes Einsteinian behavior in the sense the probes diffused faster relative to the solution viscosity in polymer solution than they diffused relative to the viscosity of water in water. But they found something else, something which truthfully we didn't see when we looked in our systems, which is in at least a particular set of systems, if you plotted D versus concentration, there was first a rather narrow, actually quite narrow region in which not much of anything happened. And then, Beyond that narrow region, you had a stretched exponential in concentration. But there was this narrow anomalous region. Um, that's one of the several anomalies you see in probe diffusion along with reentrance on occasion. The other thing they did is to demonstrate they looked at several size probes. And as you increased the size of the probe particles, as you made the probe particles larger and larger, and calculated for each probe species the microviscosity, that is the apparent viscosity being sensed by the particle. 
the viscosity you calculate from the size of the probe and the diffusion coefficient. If you measure eta mu, in these systems, as you looked at larger probes, the microviscosity increased. You may recall we've looked at other systems in which you saw the opposite behavior, and I truthfully do not have a complete explanation of why it's G, not determined by the probe size, but apparently it isn't. The other thing they demonstrated, and we may also acknowledge a series of papers by Paul Russo and his army of graduate students, was that if you have polystyrene spheres in HPC, and you don't do anything to them, they tend to bind the polymer. And they form aggregates. However, if you add to the system a surfactant, and they used Triton X100, which is a non-ionic surfactant. That is, it is a material which has a water-soluble end and water-insoluble pieces, and it's electrically neutral. If you add Triton X100 to some modest concentration, you suppress the polymer binding. The surfactant sticks to the polystyrene spheres, and it sticks more firmly than the polymer does, so you can suppress the polymer binding. Okay, so we have those results, and now we skip ahead and we say we are going to start studying this system. And in order to discuss we are going to start studying this system, I have to take a slight detour. And the detour involves spectral curve fitting. Now, the first issue is as follows. We're doing light scattering spectroscopy. What do we actually measure exactly? We send in a laser beam. We have light scattered out in some direction. The incident laser beam has a wave vector k incident. The scattered wave vector is k final. Uh, magnitude of k, this is phys the physics k, is 2 pi over lambda, lambda being the light wavelength. Um, and there is a scattering vector k final minus k initial equals k. The virtue of k final minus k initial, uh, this is the scattering vector, it's equivalent to a wavelength, k final minus k initial for this picture points this way, and the lines I'm drawing are lines of constant phase in the sense that if I look at a cosine k scattering dot r, I'm defining a cosine wave in the system. I'm not inducing a cosine wave. I'm not compressing the particles. I'm not pushing the particles along. This is a mathematical cosine wave. And I can then ask, it's, we're looking at a Fourier transform of the density of probes in solution, we can then ask what the spatial Fourier components A sub K of the particles in solution are. So there's a spatial Fourier component, and I can define it, I'll use complex exponentials instead of cosine, as something that gives me the scattering cross-section of the particles, since after all they have to scatter the light. And there's something, and but they're all the same, so I can factor this out as a constant. It really is there, but we never bother to write it down. And then there's an e to the i k dot r i, and we are summing over the position of all of the probes in the scattering volume, 
and there is a position of each probe, and this is the kth spatial Fourier component of the concentration of particles. Now, if you actually do this experimentally, there are some interesting complications. For example, we're sending this laser beam through the cell. The particles may all be equally good at scattering light, but if you have a laser beam, it has an intensity profile left to right. It may to the naked eye, if you shine it on a wall, look like it's just a uniform line of light, but in general it is the case that a laser beam has a Gaussian intensity profile, it's brightest in the middle, and then it gets dimmer to the sides and does fall off. As a result, we aren't actually weighting all of the particles the same way. And there's some very nice analysis due to my doctoral advisor, George Benedek, for example, who looks at all of, very carefully at all of these questions, and we can talk about this and stop, and it's good enough. Okay. Well, you know, these particles are Brownian particles in solution, so they're moving. And therefore, the kth spatial Fourier component of their concentration, all of the spatial Fourier components, are dependent on time. And if I plot, I'll just, well, I'll just plot the real component. If I plot A as a function of time, it zigs and zags and is random. Humans don't draw random very well. But the random has a feature. And the feature is as follows. Suppose we wait for all moments when the scattering intensity is particularly large, like this one, or this one, or this one. Suppose we start at each of those moments and record what happened at later times given that we're starting when the scattered light is very bright. After all, that's what happens when NK is large. In that case, we may get one curve at one time, and this a different curve at a different time, and so forth. And if we have a really big bump, and I say, well, look for this brightness, I might have a curve that does this at first. Well, they're all different. But if I take their average, I get out a decay. Now, what I actually do to take the average, so that I, instead of saying, we'll just wait for the intensity to have this one value, instead of doing that, I calculate what is called the intensity-intensity correlation function. And so I wait we'll look at every single possible starting moment and we will weight every single starting moment by um, how bright the light is at the front end. Our careful readers will notice I am skipping over a two to four particle issue that is not critical here. And if the light is particularly dim, well here's the average the intensity minus the average intensity is now a negative number. And that flips this curve. If I multiply by the starting number minus the average intensity, that flips this curve upside down. And so it contributes in a positive way. Net result of all of this discussion, I can measure using light scattering spectroscopy after I skip over some substantial details I can measure a k of 0, a k of t. I can measure the time correlation function in the, the k spatial Fourier component of the concentration. This object is called g1. And it's a function of k, the scattering vector, and it's a function of time. Um, it is not actually exactly what you measure directly experimentally. Experimentally, you measure, end up measuring the square of this function and have to extract this function from it. But the net result is you are measuring directly how the concentration relaxes in time.
Notice that this object is only a function of the time difference between first measurement and second measurement, and that's because you're looking at an equilibrium system, which is stationary. Well, this object has a time dependence. And the question is, what is the time dependence? How do we hold time dependence out? Well, the simplest analysis is to say, say these are all Langevin equation behaving particles. They behave, follow the Langevin equation. They're doing random Brownian motion. And if you believe that, you would say that G1 of KT, and by the way, many authors will replace K with Q. It's the same variable. It's going to be e to the minus d k squared t. You could also say for Brownian particles in a liquid with no memory, meaning water's pretty close, this would be e to the minus q squared x squared. There's got to be a half. This is G, T. And you would claim you're measuring the mean square particle displacement. We now come to a very dangerous step in the process. What I just showed you, which you can find in Bernard Pecora's beautiful book, applies to particles in a liquid that has no memory a liquid that is not viscoelastic. For example, it applies to things that are not polymer solutions. There is a very simple test known as Doob's theorem. And Doob's theorem tells you when this equation is true. That is equation is true if this is true, that is, if I plot log g versus time, and I see a straight line. If you don't see a straight line, this result is wrong. And I have recently published the correct result, the general result that replaces it. And instead of x squared, you end up with this big complicated polynomial, which involves all even moments of the displacement distribution. Now, you might ask, how, how much do we have to move away from monodispersed spheres and water for this form to fail? And the answer is, if the spheres are bidispersed, if you have a mixture of polystyrene spheres of two sizes, so that the spectrum is a sum of two exponentials, this form already gives you totally wacko answers for the mean square displacement. It's just completely wrong. Uh, OK, having warned you, it's not an exponential decay. We have a curve like this. We are experimentalists for the moment. And we would like to analyze the curve and describe it and reduce this measurement of the dynamic structure factor to a few parameters. So what do we do? Well, one thing is to say, this is almost a straight line, right? How do you describe an almost straight line? Well, it has an intercept, and it has an initial slope, and it has a quadratic term, and you will recognize here a power series. And if you are measuring a reasonably narrow set chunk of the curve, this works very nicely. However, you run into a problem. The problem did not exist 30 years ago with the measurement schemes of the period, because with the measurement schemes of the period, you only covered, oh, two orders of magnitude in t. With modern instruments, though, you can cover four or even seven orders of magnitude in time. And this curve has a little problem. 
It's a quadratic. It does this. Yes? And since it takes off to plus infinity, it doesn't work at large times. Now you can say, we will beat this by um, putting in lots and lots of terms. And of course, since the um, Taylor series is convergent, we know this method works. But you may not get terms that mean too much. An alternative due to, uh, I believe it's Barbara Friskin, was to say, we will fit to That is, we will fit to, it's almost a power series, but we're going to insist that the lead term really is an exponential, and we will use these things to describe the deviation from simple exponential behavior. Um, this works much better because the exponential always dominates the polynomial, and therefore you can be sure that this thing does go to zero at long time, and so the basic correct behavior has been stuck in. Now, there is one minor complication. If you're fitting this to a, straight, to a simple curve, you can use linear least squares to do the fit. Of course, you have to be careful because when you take a logarithm of a function, here we have a function, and there are error bars on all of the points. And the error bars in absolute size are about the same all the way down the curve. But when you take the logarithm of the function, so it, the curve looks like a straight line, it's, you warp the size of the error bars. And you must use, this point is not mentioned in many texts, but it's very important. If you do functional manipulation of data prior to fitting, yes, you should realize you have warped your error bars and you have to do weighted least squares. Uh, thanks to the hard work of Norm Mazur, and that goes back, gee, 40 years now, uh, the way of, correct way of doing this is well understood. Your alternative, however, is to say we have the actual data points. The error bars on the data points are either all the same size, good first approximation, or not quite the same size, and we can calculate what they are, and we will do nonlinear least squares fitting to extract these parameters. And the nonlinear least squares fitting we did was based on the simplex algorithm. And I shall do a brief pause. Uh, there are two completely unrelated groups of mathematical studies based on curve fitting using the simplex algorithm. And one is linear fitting to very large linear matrices, and that goes back to the 40s. And the other is functional parameter optimization. It's a completely different approach, but hiding in the middle is something called a simplex, which is a mathematical object. And so we can do this, and we can extract parameters. Well, that's very nice. So you're going to extract parameters. And the question is then, which parameters do you extract? Well, this is a nice choice. But there's another nice choice, which turned out to work extremely well. And the other nice choice is based on saying, let us look at a log-log plot log g versus log t. And x, a pure exponential, looks like that. The things you actually find typically look more like this. And they often have later relaxations. Now, there's some limits imposed by quasi-elastic light scattering. And the limit opposed by quasi-elastic light scattering is a light scattering spectrum does not contain a lot of independent free parameters. That's because it basically looks like a decaying exponential, and there is what is called ill-posedness. However, 
going back some decades, I did a set of numerical simulations and asked the question, well, how many independent free parameters does a light scattering spectrum have? So we generated various sorts of spectra of mixtures and this and that and the other thing. And we said we will have a digital correlator which say has 128 linearly spaced channels or 250 log spaced channels. So the channels out here are further apart than the ones here. Log spaced means the points look about equally far apart on a log t plot. That's not exact. And we have to put in some little corrections because all the channels aren't the same width. And that is less trivial than most people seem to understand. And then, there is, and then we ask, what can we do? Well, we will fit to cumulants. It's as good as any other fitting procedure. And we will fit to two, to two cumulants, meaning quadratic in time, or three cumulants, or four cumulants. And eventually, we have fit the spectrum to within the signal to noise ratio. Once you have got a description of your spectrum within the signal to noise ratio, you have extracted all of the information that is hiding in there. And you have used a certain number of parameters to do so. Now, maybe you have a spectrum that looks like this. And if you are very clever, it turns out there is a specific functional form that only has two parameters, or God knows one parameter, that fits this weird curve because you have outside information. But if you have no outside information, if you just use a general fitting form, um, you can determine how many distinct parameters are in there. The answer is, well, it depends how wide the spectrum is. It depends how good your signal to noise ratio is. As a practical matter, um, signal to noise ratios of 1,000 to 10,000 are about as good as you can get. It's digital. You can get do much better than with analog measurements. Oh, what is the signal to noise ratio? There's noise on this curve. There is a signal which is the amplitude at zero. The signal to noise ratio is the ratio of the amplitude at zero to the amount of wiggle you have. And with this sort of rather large signal to noise ratio, and a spectrum that has lots of features that are well spread out, meaning roughly a feature every two orders of magnitude in time, you can pull out, oh, six or eight parameters if you work hard. If you get up to eight, the parameters start to get noisy. And that is all the parameters there are. Now, what is the importance of saying there are only six or eight, or maybe four or three, in simple cases, parameters? Suppose you have some other spectral fitting technique, and it reports 20 parameters, or God knows, 50 parameters. You can be sure of one thing. Most of those parameters are, totally no are total nonsense. The parameters are all correlated with each other, and the number of independent parameters in your measurement is the same six or eight that I found using cumulant analysis. You cannot do better than that, and methods that report more parameters than this, well, you can't believe what they're saying. That's just the way things are. OK, so what, for what functional forms did we use? Well, one of the answers was a stretched exponential in time. And in some cases, when you, and a stretched exponential sort of does that. If you have two of these, they better each have an amplitude. Beta prime t to the beta prime, and you can choose your own parameterization. A sum of stretched exponentials. You notice, since the, the intercept is sort of off by itself, there are effectively one, two, three, four, five parameters, and the sum of these two is sort of constrained and independent of all of the rest of this. So you could, that's five parameters. If you had a third stretched exponential, it would be eight parameters. 
And you can do that if the three modes are separated out over six or seven orders of magnitude, which in fact they are in some cases. So we actually were able to do spectral line fitting. Uh, and what happened when we did so? Well, I suppose the first thing is to ask, what do these parameters mean? Hidden in here, you could define a characteristic time. And the characteristic time, tau, is something like theta to the minus 1 over beta. That is, instead of parameterizing things like this, you could parameterize it as e to the minus t over tau to the beta. And there's a time, and it really does have the right units of time. And if you do the math, you discover t and theta and beta are related like this. And so there's some sort of a characteristic time that describes the relaxation. What beta does, though, is to, is to describe the width in a certain sense. That is, if, we, if beta is 1, this is a simple exponential, and on a semi-log plot, I have a straight line. If beta is not 1, the curve deviates from a straight line, and it may, if beta is less than 1, the deviation is like that. If beta is greater than 1, the deviation is like that. We usually, as I recall, I think we almost never saw beta greater than 1. And what you are saying is that this curve, if you think of Laplace transforms, is a sum of exponentials. And beta is telling you what range of exponentials you'd need in a Laplace representation. Um, coming back to the discussion of fitting parameters, you might ask, well, why don't you do a Laplace transform of the spectrum? And the answer is Laplace transforms are ill-posed. Small amounts of noise lead to huge errors in the transform. That is a fundamental limitation of Laplace transforms. Uh, and the net result is um, I can make that qualitative statement Beta gives, says that there, as you make beta smaller or larger than 1, the range of exponentials in the transform changes. Uh, however, um, if you actually try to find those exponentials, you can't. OK. So we chug ahead. And we get roughly to the work that was done in my lab by Nikki LaCroix. And what can we say about that? Well, the spectra fit to something of the form e to the minus theta, t to the beta. And theta and beta both depend on polymer concentration. And they both depend on polymer molecular weight. And if you plot them, not, on the, not with the same scale, you see concentration theta or beta you see concentration dependences. And on the somewhat limited range of concentrations in molecular weights we looked at, we saw that theta, like the diffusion coefficient, had a stretched exponential concentration dependence. Um, now, we did do some investigation, and we later did some investigation, on how theta depends on scattering vector. And the answer is that theta over q square was a constant, or correspondingly, theta is proportional to q square. If you think back to simple diffusion, you had e to the minus d q squared t. And theta showed the correct Q square de lead Q square dependence. Now that we did find there are systems in which as you make the scattering vector larger, so you look at diffusion over shorter and shorter distances because Q is 1 over a distance, as you make Q larger and larger, meaning you're looking at motion over shorter and shorter distances, 
theta depended on q, and as I recall, typically increased. And therefore, if you actually did a true measurement of diffusion over different, on different length scales, you could see there was a length scale behavior. Those are hard experiments to do, actually. Okay. We also found, if you talk not about theta, but about tau, that tau over eta in, for large spheres, tau over eta was approximately independent of concentration. Now you might say this is Stokes-Einstein behavior. Well, no, it's really pseudo-Stokes-Einstein behavior because tau is not a diffusion coefficient. Yeah? Okay. Now let us chug ahead and the big part of the experimental studies. The major part of the work in the end was done by one person. It was done by Kirill Streletsky, who's now on the faculty at Cleveland State. Uh, Kirill got a dozen papers out of his PhD thesis. So, in some sense, he was my most successful PhD student. Uh, tai Ho Lin, who's now at National Tsinghua University in Taipei, well, he had to use much more limited technology of the period. He did very well, too. Uh, in any event, what Streletsky did was to do an extremely systematic study of probe diffusion in hydroxypropyl cellulosas. You change the polymer concentration. You change the probe size. <coughs> you use a lot of size <coughs> probes. He did limited studies at several molecular weights. After all, at some point you have to stop. He introduced a radically new method of analyzing spectra, and he found all sorts of results. Okay, result number one. Let's and I suppose result number zero. He found that in general, the spec probe spectra were bimodal. There were two modes. There was uh, a mode for which beta was approximately one, which we call the sharp mode. And there was another mode in which beta was significantly less than one, down to a half which we call the broad mode. We didn't quite figure this out the first time we did the experiment. At first we saw, oh, there are two modes. We'll call them fast and slow. And fast and slow were both characterized by theta, which approximately speaking gives you an initial slope. Uh, however, if you take a mode, and you make beta smaller, what happens? Well, it becomes flattened out, or curved more. Here's beta equals 1. Here's beta less than 1, yes. Well, we're making the mode broader and broader, yes. More and more. And the initial slope can get pretty steep. And that means the broad mode we would call, oh, it's the fast mode. Well, that's true. Uh, however, most people confronted with a spectrum like this, this is T, would say this is the fast mode and this is the slow mode. And depending on what beta did, uh, that identification doesn't necessarily ring through correctly because the thing that is doing this can be that mode because this mode can be quite broad. And the net result is, as you go through the dozen, ten, actually on this topic it was ten papers, and there were some papers on zeolites. If you go through the papers on this, you discover, hmm, that's very interesting. Um, the terminology changes, and life becomes a bit complicated. But by the, if you read the papers in reverse order, you are better off.
And then you, and as you read the papers in reverse order, you can laugh at all of the mistakes we made along the way. So having said that, what did he find? Well, the first thing he did is to look at theta, and this is for the sharp mode, the exponential mode. And we are going to plot theta versus sphere size, and we will get curves for different concentrations. And um, hmm, what can we say? Well, at very low con at zero concentration, we get something flat. As we increase the concentration, oh, I've really got to divide out theta zero. There is a fundamental size dependence. For small spheres, nothing happens to theta as you increase the polymer concentration. This is figure 9-33 of the book. So you increase the polymer concentration and the spheres just keep diffusing. But there's a line, and above the line, you discover that the concentration dependence becomes extremely large. That, that is, here's low concentration, here's intermediate concentration, here's higher concentration, and these curves are moving away from each other for large spheres, but not small spheres. There's a line, and there's a boundary that separates small and large spheres. And it's something in the range 50 to 70 nanometers, which is about, but not exactly, twice the size of the sphere, of the polymer coils. Now, you can characterize the size of a polymer coil in several different ways, and therefore, you don't want to push too hard on it being two, being the interesting number. The important issue is there was a boundary between small and large probe behavior. Furthermore, Kirill went over a moderate range in concentration up to um, C eta of about eight, six or eight. And over that range, this boundary was independent of concentration. Now, was it exactly independent of concentration? There's a limitation. You only have a certain number of sphere sizes, and anything that happens between one sphere size and the next sphere size, you can't really see. You can somewhat infer by extrapolating curves, but you can't really see it. And so someplace between 50 nanometers and 70 or 80 nanometers, something happens. And if you wanted to tell me that this line R scaled as concentration is C to the minus an eighth, that's, that's the chain contracting because other chains shove it in. You couldn't tell. Uh, however, there are a number of models of polymer solutions that say, here are the polymer solutions. And there is a typical distance like that, which we call psi. Now, depending on several issues like the solvent quality, the polymer, etc., the exact power varies a bit, but psi goes as c to the minus x for x someplace in the range of 3 quarters to 1. Over the observed range of concentrations, the boundary would have done very quite considerably. It very definitely does not. The boundary relative to the concentration dependence you get in mesh type theories, uh, the boundary is clearly not one of these mesh things because it doesn't, its location doesn't depend on concentration. Okay, that's particle size dependence. He also did concentration dependence. It's implicit here. He plotted a line vertically this way, collecting one sphere and parameters at different concentrations. You could have graphed the same data in a different direction. And what happens if you do that? 
Well, there are, if you look at that, there are actually four parameters sitting there. And we will look, for example, I'll just do this. This is just a sample of a very large body of work. We're looking at large spheres. And we will look at the pseudo relaxation rate, theta broad. And we will look at the associated width parameter, theta broad. And what does he find? Well, for large spheres, theta chugs along and is close to independent of concentration until you get up to, oh, 04 or 5 gram per liter. And then there is a sudden and dramatic change in the behavior. You can also look at beta. And beta is falling, and it continues to fall until you get to about the same boundary. Now, you can do the same plot for a bunch of different sphere sizes. And then it does this. And right at about 5 grams per liter, the behavior of the probes changes very dramatically. The behavior of the probes, um, in terms of what is the concentration dependence, you have one behavior in the solution-like regime. And you have a second, quite different behavior in the melt-like regime. Well, that's very nice. Because we've now done optical probe diffusion on this solution, where we saw on the viscosity a solution-like, <coughs> melt-like transition. And at the same place we saw a solution-like to melt-like transition in the viscosity, we see a transition in the diffusive behavior of spheres. And thus, we have a second set of measurements, basically completely independent of the first. And we see, the same trans we see a transition at the same concentration. Thus, we have used light scattering spectroscopy to verify the experimental claims of Quinlan and myself that there is a solution-like, melt-like transition in this polymer at the quoted concentration. Um, Carol did one other thing, which is worth noting. And he's continued doing this experimentally. And what he did, it starts with a simple integral. Integral dt, 0 to infinity, e to the minus gamma t is equal to gamma inverse. Yes? And if I have integral 0 to t dt, some mixture of gammas e to the minus gamma t. By analogy with this equation, we can say this is some average gamma inverse. Yes? Furthermore, integral 0 to t dt, t to the n a of gamma e to the minus gamma t is some gamma to the minus n plus 1. That is, if you take something that if you take a decaying exponential and integrate it over all time, you get the inverse of the relaxation rate. If you have a sum of exponentials, you get some average. And if you take the moments of A of gamma, you see that's a moment, you get moments of gamma. Well, that's just math equations. It's a trick. That's the spectrum of a pure exponential, isn't it? An arbitrary decaying spectrum, G, can be written as a sum of exponentials. And therefore, we can define a characteristic, its inverse relaxation rate, by taking g and integrating it over time. I can do the same thing here. And instead of looking, I am now looking at the moments of g. This is the opposite of all of those cumulant type behaviors, because what the cumulant behaviors do is to look at the initial slope. And the curvature, it's a Taylor series expansion around time zero, 
So in a certain sense, you are focusing at short times. The moments, because t gets bigger and bigger, focus on the long times. Now, you might say, gee, experimentally, that's going to be a little tricky. The reason it's going to be a little tricky is this integral insists on going out not to t. I wrote it wrong. It goes out to infinity. And the spe measurements of the spectrum at very large times are noisy. So computing a moment looks difficult. How do we beat this? The answer is, we take the actual spectrum. We fit the spectrum <coughs> to a function that describes the spectrum accurately, namely a sum of stretched exponentials. And we extract a theta and a beta and an amplitude and an amplitude and another theta and another beta for each of the modes. And now we do the integrals not numerically, we do the integrals analytically. And if you do these, you get moments of the spectrum. The moments are extremely reproducible and are quite stable, and you can do moment analysis of spectrum. It really works. Okay. Oh, you can do them analytically. Yeah, the um, gamma inverse has a value. It's gamma function of 1 plus 1 over beta divided by, what's it divided by? Um, theta, the 1 over beta. That's the first moment. That's for one mode. You see, you can actually do these. It's an average time. Approximately at this point, as Carol was leaving, we had a bright idea. Instead of having helium neon lasers, which were sort of 20 milliwatt lasers, we had argon ion lasers, which could give us a whole lot of power. Uh, people had already done light scattering from polymer solutions a lot. And it occurred to us we could do studies of the spectral modes of hydroxypropyl cellulose itself. So we are looking at pure HPC in water. And the core issue is we are doing this and there are no probes. What do we find? Well, what we found is at, low at fairly low concentration, the spectra are bimodal. And we can characterize the two modes. <clears throat> But as we go from low concentration up to higher concentrations, there is a line, which was at about 6 gram per liter, but you may need, it may be with better spectra, you could get to see it a bit lower. And if we plot the modes, we can, for example, plot the relaxation rates of the modes. And what happens? Well, at low concentrations, the relaxation rates of the pure polymer increase. That's not surprising. Polymer chains repel each other. They don't like to overlap. And so at low concentrations, as you in increase the polymer concentration, yeah, the hydrodynamic interactions get stronger, the repulsions get stronger faster, and the diffusion coefficient, or at least the relaxation rate, increases. And then we get up to some concentration, which is about 6 grams per liter. And at 6 grams per liter, suddenly a third mode appears. And the third mode is very slow. The two other modes out here are fairly concentration dependent, not quite. The three modes are separated by about 10 to the 4 in time scale. The correlator is happy to do this. Because the modes are separated by 10 to the 4 in time scale, you can actually see three modes in the spectrum reasonably reliably. Well, this mode has a time which is 
scale, which is greater than one second. So the signal to noise on it is not very good because even if you run all day, you don't sample very much of it. Nonetheless, you see three modes. The transition might be six grams per liter. It's something fairly close to the concentration at which you go from solution-like to melt-like. Since it's not clear, you can see that it's very slow mode exactly when it first appeared. Um, you would hesitate to say that true transitions are exactly the same or not. At least I would hesitate to say so. Um, okay. So what happens? Well, we can do a series of different measurements. And um, the first thing is, yeah, you see three modes here. You see mode structure in the diffusion of the probes. But we can see, say quite firmly that these two modes are not the same as the two probe modes. Uh, you might think, well, one reason you see two probe modes is the probes are entrained by the polymers. And as the polymers drag the probes along, uh, you see the polymer diffusion reflected in the probe diffusion. And you do see probe relaxations at sort of the right time scale. However, the concentration dependences of the probe modes and of the polymer modes are opposite. As you increase the polymer concentration, the polymer relaxations occur more and more rapidly. Not a lot more rapidly, but clearly more rapidly. As you increase the polymer concentration, the probe motions are slowed down. So even though you are seeing events happening on the same time scale, the measurements conclusively refute the idea that you're seeing entrainment. The polymer drags the probe along. Uh, if you are familiar with the old literature, you can find people who speculated that there was such a thing as entrainment. And the speculation was based on the observation that, um, gee, um, you see things happening on the same time scale. And even though the theoretical calculations don't give any hint of how you could get entrainment, um, well, perhaps that would be what you get. OK. The Strelecki results do one other thing. And I've sort of hinted, I've mentioned it a few times, but there are a few more pieces of interpretation. The Strelecki measurements indicate that there is a fundamental length scale in HPC solutions. And the length, length scale, as it happens, is about the probe polymer radius of gyration. And the first was the transition at something like 50 to 70 nanometers in probe behavior between small probes and large probes. The second, however, there are a few more of these. Um, suppose you measure the relative amplitude of the sharp and the broad modes, and you change the scattering angle. The relative amplitude of the two modes depends on scattering angle. And you could say the two amplitudes cross in intensity, or you could say the ratio is about 1. And it is 1 at a particular value of Q, namely, the crossover occurs when Q inverse is about 70 nanometers. Oops. 70 nanometers. You can also go in and say, well, that's very nice. Uh, and you can also look at the behavior of the broad mode relaxation rate as a function of Q. And you discover that at small q over large distances, gamma b is fairly constant. But at large, meaning <coughs> we could perhaps say this, it's gamma. But at larger q, relaxations happen more rapidly. And the crossover in q occurs at about Q inverse is about 50 nanometers. 
I would not get at all upset as to whether this number and that number are the same or different. Uh, first of all, you don't know whether equality is the interesting quantity or not, or whether it's supposed to be 0.8 or 1.2, but it's some number in there. Second, this isn't a sharp line, and you only have a certain number of measurements with a certain degree of accuracy. Uh, there is one more thing you can do. You can compare the modes of the polymer and the probes. Yes? Uh, and what happens if you look at the intermediate relaxation rate probe mode There are three modes, fast, intermediate, slow. If you look at the intermediate mode, there is a concentration above which the concentration dependence becomes much more marked. When does this occur? It occurs approximately when the time scale of the probe intermediate mode becomes greater than the time scale of the polymer intermediate mode. That is, the probe intermediate mode slows down with increasing polymer concentration. The um, time scale, now I said that backwards, the time scale of the probe mode gets longer with increasing polymer concentration. This is the inverse of the rate. The time scale of the polymer becomes faster with increasing polymer concentration. These are the two intermediate modes. There is a concentration at which the two time scales switch, and now the time scale of the probe mode is slower than the time scale of the polymer mode. We're talking about the intermediate modes only here. Well, that's very interesting. And it depend, the crossing point depends on the concentration, on the probe size. However, if you have a probe that is about 50 nanometers large, the point at which the probe and the polymer tau time scales are about the same is C plus, the transition concentration. And so if you use probes of this interesting length scale size, the probe mode and the polymer mode, intermediate modes, are about on the same time scale at C plus. And so we have a bunch of completely unrelated seemingly ways of extracting a length scale from the data. And these data are consistent in saying the interesting length scale is about 50 nanometers. And the length scale does not care what the polymer concentration is. 50 nanometers is about the size of an intact polymer chain. And in a certain sense, it makes sense this is a significant length scale. Namely, that means that polymer beads, think of polymer as being a pearl necklace, Polymer beads that are on the same chain must stay attached to each other. And therefore, there is a length scale that is about the size of a whole polymer chain over which beads on infinite time scales must move together because they're covalently bonded to each other. OK. I have 10 minutes. So we will push on and we will do two more sections. And one of the sections we will do is as follows. This is, if I recall correctly, 912. And it's largely based on the work of Wynne Brown at Uppsala and his student, Peugeot. And what they did is to measure self-diffusion coefficients, single particle diffusion coefficients. But they did something important. They measured a probe diffusion coefficient for an honest-to-goodness probe particle, a silica sphere, 
they also measured a tracer diffusion coefficient of polymer, of polymer chains going through the same polymeric matrix. That is, you have some matrix polymer. Now they used, if I recall correctly, polyisobutylene. And we confront the matrix polymer with silica spheres, or we confront the matrix polymer with a polymer coil, and we measure the diffusion of these two very different objects through the same matrix. Question? How do they make sure when they're using the same polymer that there is no leaching from the matrix itself? Did they do that? Or? You mean how do you tell you're yeah. looking at the matrix polymer? And, and, and not, the, not the, the probe that you just introduced. Well, you are looking at the probe. You, that's, the, you arrange things and you have a matrix polymer and you have a probe polymer and if the two pro if the two if the matrix and probe polymer are very different in molecular weight you can see both modes an alternative method of doing the same experiment would be to do fluorescence relaxation after photo bleaching in which you tag a few of the pol matrix polymers or the spheres with a fluorescent molecule that you then bleach so there's several different ways of doing the experiment. And what they found, well, if you have large spheres, and you compare the motion of the large spheres with motions of tracers of similar size, Ratio is about one. That is, large spheres and chains are slowed down to about the same amount. But you could also look at small spheres, and you could look at matrix polymers. I'm sorry, you could look at probe polymers, D of tracer chains and D of probe spheres and you increase the concentration of the matrix, the probe chains and spheres are quite dilute, and you measure the diffusion coefficient. And out to the concentrations at which they measured both, what happens? Well, the spheres are slowed down by about tenfold. These are small spheres. The matrix chains are slowed down by about 300-fold. I said matrix. The probe chains are slowed down by 300-fold. That is, the matrix is far more effective at slowing down tracer chains than it is at slowing down spheres. They also continued the uh, increasing the concentration of the matrix polymer looking at the spheres and found that if you increase the matrix concentration enough, you could slow down the probe spheres by th a factor of 300 also, but you had to use more matrix concentration. Now, from the standpoint of um, reputation type models, this is an extremely alarming result. Why is it an alarming result? Well, here is the alleged transient pseudo-lattice, transient gel. A polymer molecule can go through other polymer chains, head first, tail first. A sphere is obliged to move as a lump. And therefore, the polymer, because it can advance head first, tail first, has extra modes of motion that the sphere does not. And so you would predict if, if, the, if the holes in the lattice are fairly small, you would sort of predict that the polymer chain ought to be able to move faster than the spheres. That's exactly the opposite of what you find. Now you could say, well, you didn't go out far enough in concentration and if you went out far enough in concentration, so your lattice polymer matrix was really thoroughly entangled, you'd see the opposite behavior. 
However, in, to see, in order to see the opposite behavior, if you increase the concentration enough, one of two things would have to happen. And the first thing that would have to happen <coughs> is that the spheres are slowing down, and the polymer chain's self-diffusion has to stop, not necessarily completely stop changing, but has to roll over so that the chains are now diffusing faster than the spheres. The other alternative is the probes slow down and slow down, and suddenly they crash to a stop and cross the curve due to the matrix, the probe chain cell tracer diffusion. These would both be sudden deviations from stretched exponential behavior at some high polymer concentration. Well, that behavior just has never been seen. And therefore, even though you could say Brown, Brown and Zhao just didn't go out far enough in concentration, and therefore their switch could have occurred if they'd gone out far enough, in order for the switch to occur, something would have happened either to the concentration dependence of the probe spheres or the concentration dependence of the tracer chains. There would have had to be a crossover in their behavior, concentration dependence, of a sort that has never been seen before. And since that has never been seen before, the reasonable inference is it doesn't exist. And therefore, there is no, you could say there's such a crossover, but if you saw it, it would be rather odd. We are almost exactly out of time. We have reached particle tracking, and in the next lecture, I will discuss particle tracking as a method of studying motion in polymer solutions. Until then, class dismissed.